Hey everyone, welcome to Founders 365 with me, Stephen Haggerty. Today I'm joined by the founder of the 800% Club, Mr. Glenn Lundy. How are you today, Glenn? I am great, man. Grateful to be here. Appreciate you sharing this space and this time with me. Ready to rock and roll, my man. Excellent. You are you are a pro at this, so I have no doubt this is going to be a fantastic interview. So let's <laughs> now don't set don't set us up for failure. Yeah, no man. pressure. You're jinx no it, pressure. man. <laughs> it's, uh, I like to really put the pressure on my guests just so they can either live up to it or fail miserably. Either way, it's a fantastic watch. There you go. Uh, I, I'm with win-win. you. I understand that exactly. Uh, so the 800 percent club. What is it? Why 800 percent? Why not 600 percent? Why not a thousand percent? Where did that all come from? Yeah, so eight hundred percent club is uh, part of my company where I work with the leaders in organizations, primarily car dealerships uh, all across the country, and I help them scale their volume, their profitability, their employee retention, and their overall dealership culture. Uh, The reason we call it 800% is I was the general manager at a small dealership in Paris, Kentucky uh, that I I started back with them in 2011. And over a period of six years, we were able to grow that dealership 800% from selling 120 cars a month to ultimately breaking 1,043 cars in the month of March 2018. And so... That's where 800% Club comes from, man. Been there, done that. And now we're showing other leaders across the industry how they can do the same. Love it. it makes complete sense now, which is great. And luckily, it sounds like a cool number as well. <laughs> it does, percent right? Club just doesn't quite cut yeah. it. 800% Club, you're like, yeah, that sounds good. I can dig so, that. So, <laughs> you know, you, you're obviously in the industry for a long time. Uh, and before reaching the 800% sort of milestone for you, at what point did you go, you know, this is something I can teach to others. This is something I can go in and help replicate in other dealerships and all, and I'm guessing all, also in other businesses as well. Yeah, no doubt, man. So I have two seasons that I existed in the auto industry. I had one season where I spent years and years and years of my life working 70, 80 hours a week for very little reward our dealership wasn't growing and uh, we 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 weren't going backwards but we weren't really moving mm. forward and You're it doing, just was just making do yeah just making do and it wasn't consistent you know maybe a little bit of growth here and there and then we'd fall back so on and so forth so that was one season of my life in the car business i got out for a small period of time And when I decided, I met my wife and we had a child and she was like, Glenn, I need you to grow up a little bit and get a real job. (laughs) And so I went back to the car business and I went in with the mindset that if I was going to be in the auto industry, I was going to make a massive impact, not just in my store, but in the industry as a whole. And so I kind of created this mission to eradicate the negative stigmas associated with the car business. And when I went into this particular store, that was kind of our, it was like our proving grounds. Like, can we really do things 180 degree different from everybody else and have success? And so as our success continued to grow and climb, and we ultimately reached that pinnacle of selling over a thousand cars in a tiny little town, man, population 9,600 people, tiny little town. And so when we broke that milestone, it was like, okay, we've eradicated the negative stigmas in this little bubble. And now it's time to expand to the whole industry, which was kind of my commitment I had made Mm. to myself and my wife, you know, when I got back in. What were some of those initial walls that you came up against? You know, like you said, you broke the bubble, small town, created that amazing growth. And then you thought, let's do this big let's go let's go national but i'm guessing in the automotive industry in the u.s there's probably a lot of like old school thinkers and that versus new school mentality and you're coming up with the new school mentality going hey things can be extremely good for you Mm -hmm. what were some of those challenges that you you came up against when you first decided to go national well, we still um, we still face some challenges with that. <laughs> Most owners in this industry are like third generation, mm. uh, third or fourth generation at this point. I imagine point. it's a bit like farmers. 
Yes, exactly. You know, the auto industry has always been good. It's always been profitable. And and so, you know, dealers across the nation, they started back in the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, and they just hand these dealerships down, you know, through throughout their families. And so running into some of that old mindset is always a challenge. One of the biggest challenges is when I first started working with dealerships, when I first left my dealership and started working with dealerships outside across the country, I was kind of, even myself, I was in a little bit of an old model. So I was flying into these dealerships. It would take me a day of travel. I'd spend a day in the store and then I would give them a list of all the different things that, hey, we need to change this, 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 Mm -hmm. this, and that. And then I'd spend a day traveling back. So it was three days away from my family, one day in store. And I would call these guys, Stephen. I'd call them two weeks later. How are things going? Dude, it's amazing. This stuff's awesome. And then I'd call them two weeks after that. They'd be like, dude, it's really good. This stuff's great. And then I'd call them two weeks after that. And they're like, "Uh, we kind of forgot that. (laughs) What what were we supposed to be doing? We've kind of gone back to our old. Slipped into the old habit. Yeah. And so I'm beating my head against the wall going, dude, I'm traveling. It's taking me three days away from my family. I'm showing them what they need to do. They don't hold on to it or retain it for long term. It's not really making a massive impact that I want it to make. It's not cost effective. And so I shifted my entire business model from one where I was on site Mm. and delivering solutions. Traditional like consultant role, really. That's right. Yeah, I completely shifted that in November of last year to where now I work with all of my, well, plus on top of that, I could only help one dealer every three days, Mm -hmm. right? Like, how do you scale that? And so I shifted the entire model to online, virtual. We do all of our training. I meet most of the dealerships uh, and dealer owners that I work with. I've never stepped foot in their dealership. We meet once a week on Zoom calls. We go through their strategies. They tell me their problems. I help them solve those. And then I hold them accountable for, you know, I hold them accountable to, um, to, to get results. I also pull all the dealers together in a group. So it's not just my mind. It's the mind of all these other leaders that are the in the, in the industry. And so we have small groups. Each group has 20 dealers in it. We meet weekly. And so now I can serve 20 dealers in one hour versus before it was one dealer in three days and it's more cost effective for the dealer and myself and we get better results because i can hold them accountable yeah it all makes sense but you go to tell a guy that that's been in the business for 30 years (laughs) that you're never going to step foot in his store and you're going to help him and that is a mental barrier that can be very challenging to break through but once we break through it's it's incredible how do you manage the difference for you in terms of that traditional consulting approach versus the obviously work from home everything virtual do you struggle with that or have you found that sort of nice equal balance so what i've found is that me expressing to these leaders in the in the in the car business what i do and how it works is not anywhere near as effective as people that are currently in the program, I get testimonials like crazy, man. If you're in my program, you better expect to be in front of a camera at some point. (laughs) That's That's just that's one of the levels to get in. You have to be comfortable on camera. You have to be comfortable (laughs) on camera because I am going to have you scream from the mountaintops that you're getting results and it's because you're working with me. And so we gather a lot of testimonials and we share that information out through our social media channels. Uh, Any dealers that we're prospecting and looking to bring on board, we send them an archive, like too many testimonials for them to be (laughs) able to watch them all. So when they hear it from other dealers, other guys, just like them that are third generation, that are in small towns, you know, when they hear that we're getting results, it's much easier for them to uh, come over to to the 800 percent club side. Exactly. Let you let your customers do the talking. That's it, man. Let well. them do the talk. I just I just make sure to get results, you know. Otherwise, they'll 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 talk the other way. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I want to talk about the work life balance then, because uh, you know you you may, you haven't mentioned it yet, but on the blurb you sent me, father to seven. Yeah. I mean, you know, most people have maybe one, two, three kids, but seven kids and managing your business, and obviously being married, 
And then also, I suspect, having some sort of social life, how do you make sure that every day you're showing up for your clients, you're there, you're fresh, you're focused, but also obviously showing up for your kids, showing up for your family? How do you create that balance? And how, for you, is is that balance? Like, what is the thing that you enjoy doing most on both levels? Yeah, so I I do I'd, I'd say that the thing I probably enjoy doing most is making all of those babies. That's probably the part that I enjoy. <laughs> that's the it. Most. That's, that's <laughs> but I've got everything seven. Else is, is everything else is that's it. I've got seven kids. I've got another one on the way right now. Uh, number eight's on the oh, way. Crazy. And um, really, I had to redefine that word balance. So a lot of people think balance, you know, when you think balance, you think equal, right? I have mm -hmm. to spend an equal amount of time with family, an equal amount of time at work, an equal amount of time socially. Everybody's looking for that. And what I had to do is, is realize, like, it's not about an equal amount of time. It's about making sure that I'm serving whoever I'm front of in the way they need to be ultimately served. So to give you an example, my daughter, uh, you know, my daughter, Willow, she's six years old. 20 minute bike ride with Willow. And dude, she loves you to the moon. <laughs> like that's what she loves. You just go outside, you go on a bike ride. So if I can spend 20 minutes a day with Willow, I don't have to spend, you know, if I spend nine hours a day at work, I don't have to spend nine hours with Willow yeah. for it to be equal. Such she can get point. just as much out of 20 minutes with her. So I just make sure that my time is invested. I think that that's the biggest key. If you're going to be at work, then you better produce, right? Like invest your time wisely, maximize every minute, and your spouse and your kids will appreciate you for it. When you're at home, you need to invest your time wisely and maximize every minute. And if you do that, your family also will appreciate you for it. So, you know, I know people that, I know guys, especially in this industry, that will not miss a day of work for six years, right? They'll never once call in sick. That's the crazy. boss asks them to stay late. They're like, absolutely. The mm -hmm. boss says, go do this. They say, absolutely. And then they go home and their kid says, hey, daddy, can you pick me up? And they say, no, I'm tired. Yeah. Yeah. What? Are you kidding me? You would never say no to your boss ever. But you say no to your kids. Mm. That's the, 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 the fear of no stability, though, isn't it? Like a yeah. job means is very traditionally means stable, means future, means retirement, right. means you know you're doing a great thing in the in sort of the uh, the community. It, mm -hmm. It's looked upon in that way, and mm -hmm. I think even now, even though entrepreneurship and and business owners have obviously been booming for the last 20, 30 years, I still think there's a huge element of having that secure job is the safety net sure uh, and having that sort of mentality is so common but what i often find is there's always a catalyst there's always something that happens for business owners that have gone from having a job to to working for themselves there's always a catalyst of something happening for them to realize you know i want to work for myself i want to build sure. my my own empire so I guess the question I'm coming to is, what was your catalyst? What was your moment that you thought, it's time to build my own empire? You know, ultimately working in the dealership that I was at, I had it made, man. It was a very comfortable position. I was the face of the dealership. Um, I could pretty much, you know, come and go as I please. I drove whatever cars that I want. I was making great money. We had the white picket fence and all of those things, right? You had the American was, dream. We had the American dream, man. It was really, really, really a good spot. Um, to be in, but I knew and understood almost from the get-go that as long as someone else's name was on that building, what I was the the life that I was creating was really only for me, right? Like I was going to get to enjoy it, and my wife would enjoy it, and my kids would enjoy it growing up. But if anything happened to me, my wife, my kids. They're all back to square one. My wife's out there looking for a job. You know, yeah, we've got a little nest egg and so on and so forth. But at some point, she was going to have to go back to work if I go down. Mm -hmm. And so knowing that the only way to create 
long-term generational wealth. I shouldn't say the only way because you can do it through real estate and things like that. But sure. as far as long-term generational wealth from a, from a business standpoint, I want to be able to create something that lives beyond me, right? That lives beyond me, that if my hands break down, if my knees break down, <laughs> if my body starts to break down, you know, my family can still continue. I can pass that torch. And you can't do that if somebody else's name is on the building. So true. So in that point, you know, now the majority of your business is online and, and you know, catering all across America. Do you still want your name on an actual building? Do you Would you still love to have the Glenn Lundy building that your kids can come and see you at work? My, my building's really online now. Right? It's like a virtual building, right? Uh, you know, physical retail space is not all it's cracked up to be mm -hmm. anymore. So we do have a small office and I have a few employees here um, and so on and so forth. And I take a lot of pride, in, you know, in that. But but ultimately, it's the name that's left on the industry. It's, it's, it's the impact that mm -hmm. we can make and create systems to where that can continue on uh, you know, for decades and decades and decades to come between online platforms and just utilizing the tools that we have. I mean, it's 2020, right? We don't need bricks and mortar exactly. anymore. Another key example of the difference between that old school versus new That's school. right. That's right. It's, That's right. Um, and, you know, in terms of purchasing behaviors as well, people are purchasing differently. People are purchasing completely online, no matter what the product is from, you know, your groceries all the way up to houses where, you don't even view them before you own them. So I think this mentality is obviously continually going to grow more into that. I think obviously 2020, super weird year, but that obviously also helped a lot of people realize that actually they don't need to leave the house and they don't need to go to an office. They don't need to do these things. For you, what's one of the learnings that has brought out of 2020 so far that you've changed or you're going to implement moving forward to make your business a better business? I think the biggest lesson we've learned as a company here is, you know, speed is crucial, man. Like we were kind of building the business. We were moving, we were adding some stores. We were doing okay, right? Like, you know, it's exciting. We're on our way. And imagine what we're going to look like five years from now. It's yeah. going to be amazing, right? Five we kind of had vision. that. Yeah, we kind of had that mindset. And then this made me realize like, bro, hold up. You better get off the stick and move with <laughs> speed. Like we need to add dealers now. We need to create systems now. We have to we have to bunker down our business to where anything that happens outside of it like doesn't affect us right yeah, we have to yeah. create that that stability and so that's been our biggest thing man as soon as COVID hit we were blessed uh all of our dealers continued to stay with us because we had already set up and they were already used to training virtually whereas a lot of my friends in this industry that were still doing the old school on-site consulting their businesses instantly mm stopped their revenue streams instantly stopped and so we were blessed to have converted back in november before covid you know ever kind of hit um but really just scaling that doing it now i've added four employees since covid hit so that we can move faster and just that realization that there is no absolutely no promise that you've got five years to slowly build whatever it is you think is going to carry you through for the for this generation and the next. Build yeah. it, build it now. Let's freaking roll. But because you've had to speed up, and you, well, you haven't had to, but luckily you did speed up, and obviously COVID hit, and you realize you saw the potential, and you you, you absolutely took it by the hands. Has that have had to change that five year vision? or three year vision or 12 month vision because you're doing things quicker now you're you're set up you've you've streamlined your systems like you said you've got staff now to be able to implement more surely that then speeds up your runway oh yeah no doubt man and and on top of that i like we're i'm shocked i'm literally shocked that the level at which i thought i was operating <laughs> what was what was an okay level six months ago, I look back and go, you lazy son of a gun. <laughs> like, 
holy smokes, we could have been doing this this whole time. Like, golly, man. So, you know, I'm kind of looking back with just a little hair of regret. Like, never, man. You know, and uh, but but I'm using that as fuel now mm. to to really push us forward and go, OK, we'll never make that mistake again. Uh, we are capable. All humans are capable of so much more than they ever imagined that they were. And I think a lot of people, you know, currently have been woken up to that idea like, holy smokes, like there are things that I can do that I never imagined. There's comforts that I can live mm. without. Right. Uh, I can shift. I can pivot. I can change. I can learn how to do a Zoom call. I can <laughs> learn how to connect with people, you know, virtually. I can learn how to work from my office and think outside the box. I can learn how to serve clients a different, little bit differently. So I think it's woken up the I can in a lot of people, including myself yeah. and my employees. Like, oh, we can do that. We just got to go with the energy, you know, and and muster up and put it in and, and rock and roll. Love that. You know, you obviously help a lot of people through your program and mentorship and consulting approach with that. For you, how do you stay on top of your own game? Do you have mentors? Do you have coaches? How do you make sure that your personal environment, excluding your customers, because I know a lot of people sometimes get that trap, that confused. They go, well, I've got great customers, so my network's pretty good. But actually, it has to be, you know, your own personal network like I said, excluding your customers, do you? How do you make sure that your network is up to scratch? Who do you sort of look up to and work with? Yeah, man, I've got uh, I've got coaches, I've got mentors, and I have. Uh, I, I hate to say use this word because it sounds really awful, but I have I have seasonal close friends, right? I know and what I, you mean. Yeah, I use that word seasonal because I believe our role on this planet is to make an impact in other people's lives and help them get to that next level so that they can see over the edge that there's more. And sometimes when people see over the edge that there's more, they then go for the more and you're stuck. You know, you you were the one that helped them up. And, 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 and that's OK. Like, I think a lot of people get so caught up in the relationship and 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 maybe bitterness or grudges or whatever and they don't propel themselves forward so right now i have a very tight-knit group of mentors and friends that are helping me see levels that i never saw um, before and some of the people that i used to roll with that were integral in my growth to this point i i don't I don't see them so much anymore, mm. right? You know, I love them and I might check in on them, you know, every few weeks, but we're just in different in different places. Yeah. And so I have paid coaches, paid mentors, and then I have just also people that I've connected with over this last year and a half that I serve them as best they can. And in, in, in turn, they help me propel my life forward as well. Love it. It's so important to make sure that, you know, you're, you're such a valid point there where, people that are with you at certain periods of time, and it's okay, I think this is a big thing for people, it's okay to let people go. Yeah. It's okay to let your original mentor that helped you two years ago go. Right. You know, because they're always gonna be part of your life, like you just said, but it doesn't mean that they have to be direct in your current stage of life. Right. Uh, and, and it doesn't know, have to be ugly or ago. mean or bad or no, anything exactly. like that. You know, it's just like, Dude, thank you so much for getting me to here. Yeah. I will treasure this forever and I'll see you on Christmas. You know, like <laughs> you'll get a Christmas gonna, card. That's right. And, uh, <laughs> when, we're, when we're in the same city, we'll have a drink. That's exactly that's right. It. That's you exactly know, keep right. Keep it nice and simple. Glenn, for you, what is what is next? What is next on the 800% Club? You know, you've got. Uh, your daily Facebook live show, your busy, busy man. You've got another, you've got your eighth child on its way, which again, mind boggling. But what is next for Glenn? Well, it sounds like maybe a show on TLC or something <laughs> like that. I'm What's that show? That really, really... Well, in the UK, we have a, this this one family and they have 21 children. Yeah, like the Duggars, right? The it's, Duggars, uh, I think. T yeah, tw and every year they get a new show. It's like 19 <laughs> kids and counting. Next year, right. 20 kids. And, right. and every year they go, this is our last one. Right. This is now our they're last at 21 one. and I'm pretty sure she's pregnant again. So it's like... <laughs> Come on, man. So maybe, maybe that's what's next. No, I don't yeah. I don't know. I tease, I tease. But um, you know, really what we're doing right now is we're just trying to increase our outputs 
impact as many as we can. Uh, we've kind of grown this way a little bit as far as like we've grown out and mm -hmm. expanded and that continues to ripple and we're, and we're really enjoying that. Um, and so now I'm kind of making sure that as the business grows, it doesn't lose the tightness. It doesn't lose its smallness. It doesn't lose the intimate part of it. Cause that's yeah. where people really expanding it. Growth is in those close, tight, intimate relationships. And so we're focused on how do we create areas of intimacy within the big to keep our, our, our core values, you know, in place. And, and that's really what we're focused on. So we've got 800% club. We have a rising grind elite mastermind group now where I'm working directly with people from my rising grind group. They're paying a monthly recurring and I'm mentoring and, and coaching them on a smaller level, more intimate level, you know, two hours a week, that type of deal. Um, and so we're working on that. And then we're hoping next year we can get back into our event game. And we love, we do a ton of stuff online, but there's still a ton of value of bringing yeah. people together. So even my 800% club, we do three retreats a year where we just mm, come together, that. shake hands, hit elbows, you know, whatever you want to do it, high five, <laughs> whatever high feet, thing is. whatever the thing is. And so uh, we're hoping to be able to get back on the schedule with, with, with some of those um, live events yeah. as well in this uh, I, Next we, year. I run a over here we do live events for founders as well uh, and there's something that can never quite cut you know you could have the best zoom set up the best virtual summit but there is n you can never be an in-person that's right live event whether it's just a networking event or you know the mastermind style event you know retreats there's there's change that happens at those events mm -hmm. that just cannot happen when that person is sat in their house around their stuff around their kids around their family there's real power in taking people out of their environment you no know, spoke doubt. about environment earlier but out of their environment putting them in our environment or our man-made sort of purposeful built environment and that's where you see like that amazing change happen yeah, I'm, man. A, I'm a big fan of that. So like you, I cannot wait until um, hotels. And, and I think it's not so much hotels, actually. I think it's when people are comfortable with it. That's right. Because hotels are already sort of starting to open up and things. Sure. People still are not that comfortable getting on planes, going to conferences, being in rooms with other people that they don't know. So right. I think there's a couple more months of that left. But boy, are we... Yeah, November there? 5th, right? We're all, we're all looking forward to... That's it. Uh, that's November it, November 5th. 5th. Apparently, we'll, well, I don't know what's happening on November 5th, but hey, if you're putting that date out there, we'll do it. We'll do it. <laughs> Let's just, just say there's a little election that goes on on November 4th. Is that the big date in America? It's a big date in America, and, and hopefully we'll Should, have some transformation after that. Uh, what, what, gut instinct, though? What do you think? Like on who's going to win? Yeah. No clue, man. It's a such crapshoot, dude, because it's it's all so corrupt. Like, how do you? Uh, yeah. It's like trying to pick a, uh, you know, like a, a Don King sponsored boxing match, right? Don King's known for throwing boxing matches yeah. his whole career, right? Like, who do you pick? Like, you know, you, you think it's gonna go one way, and then all of a sudden a chair comes flying out from the audience, and knocks <laughs> the dude out, and then it goes the other way. So you can't really predict it. The only thing that I can predict is once we can get through the politics of what's going on in the world today, I think that we can um, maybe shift our focus a little bit on, on, on to getting the world back on, on, uh, on, on track. And let's, yeah. let's get some solutions for these problems that are going on instead of just fighting about them every day. Exactly. Solution based, solution based focus is always going to win. Yeah. Uh, no, that, matter I agree. What, no matter what. And you obviously put that into your business, which is such a great trait to have. Um, Thank you. For me, you know, my, one of my final questions for you, Glenn is, how can people find out more about you? How can people get in touch? How can people watch your daily rise and grind? Yeah, show? man. <laughs> well, actually, if anybody's watching right now and you have a free afternoon, Claude Silver, who is the chief heart officer for Gary Vaynerchuk, uh, she is his number two in command at his company. I'm going to be interviewing her at 2.30 over at official Glenn Lundy uh, here on Facebook. For those of you that are watching live, I know those, those of you that are watching on uh, are listening on at a future date, if you just go to glennlundy.com, 
It connects you to my Facebook, my Instagram, our Rise and Grind shows, our groups, our YouTubes. All of that stuff is at glennlundy.com, and I would be more than grateful to have you come join us. Glenn, thank you so much for coming on. I think you, you've really tapped into a really interesting market, and you are completely smashing it. So congratulations on all your thank success. Thank you. Thank you, man. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Glenn. And thanks, everyone, for listening and watching. This has been Founders 365.